one of the biggest threats to modern medicine. That's what health experts say about drug-resistant infections caused by so-called superbugs. UN member states have signed an agreement to provide a global response, but will that be enough? This is Inside Story. Hello, welcome to the program. I'm Adrian Finnegan. While accepting his Nobel Prize in 1945, the biologist who discovered penicillin warned there is a danger that the ignorant man may easily underdose himself and by exposing his microbes to non-lethal quantities of the drug will make them resistant. Now, more than 70 years after Alexander Fleming's words of caution, world leaders are signing a UN declaration to fight what doctors and scientists describe as our biggest global health threat. We'll get to our guest in just a moment, but first, Al Jazeera's Tarek Basley sets up our discussion. Since the discovery of penicillin almost 90 years ago, we've relied on antibiotics to treat bacterial infections. The problem is many of the bacteria that make us sick have developed resistance to those antibiotics. This means the drugs don't work, and we're increasingly finding ourselves without any way of treating illnesses that were once easy to cure. On a global scale, it's estimated 700,000 people a year are dying from drug-resistant infections. And according to a UK government report, that could rise to as many as 10 million a year by 2050 if nothing's done. That's why the UN General Assembly is considering the threat. It's just the fourth time in its history a health issue has been subject to a special session. The declaration sees all 193 member states commit to encouraging the development of new antibiotics. They're also promising to increase public awareness of the threat and develop surveillance and regulatory systems for the use and sale of antibiotics for humans and animals. The declaration is being compared to the UN's efforts to combat climate change and is recognition that a global response is required for what is becoming a global health problem. Well, before we bring in our panel, we're going to speak to Sally Davis, who joins us from the United Nations in New York. She's the Chief Medical Officer for England. Uh, Professor, thanks for being with us. Uh, why is this UN declaration so important? What's it going to do to help solve the problem? Well, antimicrobial resistance, that is drug-resistant infections, are a complex, a wicked issue that needs the whole of society to respond and we have to respond. At the present, over 700,000 people are dying every year because of drug-resistant infections. And that's set to go up unless we take action. And Lord O'Neill's review, an independent review for government, has shown how disastrous that will be. And if you want to take cross-sectoral, cross-societal action, the WHO, the supreme body, as it were, for health and health standards, has a role to play. But this goes into agriculture, it goes into the environment, the food chain, and, and how we use antibiotics altogether. So we feel, along with many other countries, that heads of state have to understand it and have to take action. So this high-level week at the UN General Assembly is an opportunity to bring it to their attention, to demand action so their people don't die. You, you say demand action. We've seen how difficult it is to, to get the world to come together over climate change. Is there any reason to believe that there'll be any less disunity over AMR? I think this is easier to understand. There is no scientific dissent. Everyone agrees that this is natural selection, that drug-resistant infections occur, they kill people, and it's getting worse. Moreover, we all understand the underlying reasons, the need for hygiene, sanitation, infection prevention and control, and everyone knows we have not had a new class of antibiotics come into clinical practice since the late 80s. So it is clear it's understood, it's not disputed, and we're now getting the data on deaths. So it will be much easier to address than climate change because it's in people's faces. Global leaders there at the UN have pledged, what, $790 million to tackle antimicrobial resistance. Is that enough? No, 
that's the start. There's a lot of work to be done. Our government from the UK has pledged £265 million as the Fleming Fund to help low-income countries develop their laboratory systems and surveillance. So we actually know the size of the problem. At the moment, it's modelling and it will probably be an underestimate and the deaths are going up and up. So as we get better data, we will be able to make the case for why we should have more money and where it will be spent with good effect. Professor, many thanks indeed. All right, let's bring in uh, our other guests for today's programme. Now, from the UN in New York, we're joined by uh, Jim O'Neill, whom Sally Davis was just talking about, Lord O'Neill, the chairman of the UK Commission Review on Antimicrobial uh, Resistance. And uh, from Kuala Lumpur, Christoph Wiat, a professor at the University of Nottingham, specialising in the discovery of antibiotics in southeastern Asia. Gentlemen, welcome uh, to you both. Jim O'Neill, um, is antimicrobial resistance, um, so-called superbugs, really, are they the biggest health threat that the world faces today? Uh, I've persuaded myself that's the case. Um, I think uh, part of the complexity of the puzzle is because it's not an eye-catching, immediate uh, thing out of nowhere, like Ebola or various other things that have ha hit the world the past few years. A lot of people don't really believe it's such a problem, but that, as I think Sally said to you, the 700,000 people around the world are already dying from it today. I think the number of people that die every year in Europe are more than uh, the number of people that died from the whole uh, Ebola outbreak. So. It's an enormous thing, and as my review showed, if we don't do something about it and we all carry on behaving exactly as we've done for my generation, by, by 2050, that's going to be uh, perhaps 10 million people a year around the world. And sadly, as with many of these things, the biggest populated countries, uh, particularly my infamous BRICS, but also uh, part of the world where, where you represent and Africa, they're going to have you know, catastrophic numbers of people that are dying from the inability to have antibiotics that work. Is, it, uh, is this problem solvable? It's not, not too late, is it? Can, can we beat the bugs but before the catastrophic consequences you talk about um, uh, uh, hit us? So, you know, I, t I tend to be uh, one of life's uh, optimists in a way. And, and what, one of the many reasons why I've loved doing this review is that you, you can find the right solutions, at least thinking about it as an economist, which is essentially what our review team did. But, but more importantly than just that, and another reason why it's been so much fun, is it feels like a lot of our ideas uh, have been picked up. So the very fact I'm talking to you from here, uh, when I first started on this two years ago, the idea that there would be a high level agreement at the UN on AMR was regarded as a bit, a, a bit nuts. And, and just as important, it's not as eye-catching to many, uh, but the G20 uh, two weeks ago made a very important statement about what they would now do to try and support a mechanism for, for new drugs. So there's a lot of things going on. Uh, of course, it's easy, even once you get the attention of policymakers, uh, for them to say the right thing. The key is in the delivery. But uh, I'm reasonably hopeful that we can galvanize the moments, let's call it, to get various things uh, further down the path of making sure we, we don't get anywhere near 10 million people dying in 2050. Christoph uh, Weert, um, Professor, you, you've said rather dramatically that the, the, the last hope for the survival of the human race is to be found in the rainforests of tropical Asia. Um, yes. Is the situation re really that dire? Why, why are the rainforests so important to the fight against uh, uh, AMR? You see, the, the rainforest um, is the last gift of Mother Nature to human race. Uh, this uh, wonder of nature encompasses thousands of species of flowering plants which are equipped with uh, lots of molecules which are yet to be identified and tested for antiviral, antibiotic and other uh, uh, properties. The big problem is that, and we really have to act on that, we must stop, we must, I repeat, stop burning and cutting that rainforest of Southeast Asia, but also Africa and South America. Um, you know, um, this rainforest is the last, again, hope for human race. Uh, that, rain that burning of the rainforest 
um, uh, is actually the source of a disappearance by the end of this century of uh, an enormous uh, amount of animals and plants, sadly. But we must bear in mind that we are all biologically linked. And at the end of the day, if we do not take care of nature, we shall be doomed. I am not so optimistic as my colleague. I think that it might be too late. We have, we have wasted a lot of time. We had in hand the most wonderful flora in Asia. We also had a lot of traditional medicines. All the traditional healers are um, slowly, um, uh, um, uh, of course, because of their age, disappearing. Knowledge in medicinal plants is also disappearing in universities and schools of pharmacy. We have, we must change our approach in drug discovery. Also, the pharmaceutical industry must play its role. According to the, some published evidence, the development of antibiotics by these uh, huge companies is not following the need. I repeat here again, we are in deep trouble. Okay. I am not so optimistic. It might be too late. Jim, what do you make of that? Why hasn't Big Pharma been more engaged in the search for, for new antimicrobial drugs? Listen, that is pretty pessimistic what uh, your other guest just said. Um, let, let me just say, uh, before I answer your question, that new, new drugs, as, it are, as crucially important as they are, are only one part of the problem. E even if we got a whole set of new drugs, which would take a, a generation, unless we change uh, all of our behavior, all seven billion plus of us, we're going to end up being resistant to those. So uh, amongst the reasons why I'm not so pessimistic as what you've just heard there is because the demand reducing side it, it, I think if you get the right attention and focus on it, it's easier to deal with than anybody's ever thought before. When I was asked to do this review, it was presented in the context of this incredible complex dilemma about new drugs and the role of pharmaceutical companies. That is really important, but we need to behave differently. We need to stop treating antibiotics like candy or sweets. And that can be done pretty easily with a, uh, with a, a powerful... Uh, information campaign and public relations and public awareness like we've seen in so many other things introduce modern technology or what I sometimes call Google for doctors to force our clinicians to behave differently and to help you and I and everybody else to behave differently and all those things are, are quite easy to do in my opinion once policymakers give it the focus that things like our review have been trying to do but, on new drugs of course it is true that in the simple way pharmaceutical companies look at these things, there is no economics to be made for them from producing new antibiotics. But again, uh, partly because of the influence of uh, voices like ours and, and others, there are initiatives that are now being considered that will either force the pharmaceutical companies to behave differently or change the relationship between incentives and risks for them. And I know from the role I've played that some of them are starting to think, it's very early days, but starting to think a bit differently about trying to uh, come up with models for new drugs. Let's put one conspiracy theory uh, to, to bed right away. Uh, while researching to today's program, um, I, I kept coming across the viewpoint that, that Big Pharma has cooked up this whole crisis with an eye on opening new revenue streams. It's inaction. Uh, ha has been deliberate uh, in, in order to, to stir up a crisis like this so that, so that they can make more money uh, eventually w w you know, by solving the crisis. <laughs> I, I, I quite like hearing conspiracy theories. So that, that's, quite a, that's quite a cool one. That, I mean, it, it is the case, and we found when we started, that Big Pharma's generalized view, this is a gross simplification, is that give us higher prices and let us have much bigger revenue streams then yeah, we'll be back at the table straight away. And, and under, under the standard way that in, uh, business uh, behaves, it's not entirely uh, irrational way of thinking, but as we've uh, pointed out at great length, and I think with some success, you can't just measure the, the return on capital from just the antibiotic production business. It has to be seen in a broader context, because all these incredible cancer drugs that, that are so useful but they all make so much money out of, they're going to be of no use to people if we have the antibiotics uh, running out. So the pharma companies have got to see about it in a, uh, think about it in a more lateral sense. And more importantly, and I know this from the business world I've come from, 
Once policymakers start to give these things attention, that's when the companies start to behave differently. So going back to what I said at the start, the fact that the G20 made a big call uh, as part of their communique two weeks ago that they are going to come back under the German pre uh, presidency with a plan for a specific model in itself is forcing the pharmaceutical companies to start thinking differently. And, okay. and so I think there's a lot of change going on from this sort of underlying status quo that seems to have been so stagnant uh, for many years. Pr Professor Weir, I'll, I'll be back with you in just a moment, but at this point I want to bring in uh, a third guest from Paris. We're joined by uh, uh, Rohit Malpani, who's the Director of Policy and Analysis for the medical charity Doctors uh, Without Borders, Médecins Sans Frontières. Uh, Rohit, thanks for being with us. Why on earth has antimicrobial Thank resistance you. been allowed to become the problem that it is? Why hasn't it been tackled? Everybody has known it, it, it was happening for years. Why hasn't it been tackled on a global scale before now? Well, we believe this really reflects a, a broader failure that we're seeing today. So this ties into not only the crisis of antimicrobial resistance, but a broader crisis around innovation and access to medicines and vaccines and diagnostics that will work where we are working today. Uh, the failure to build effective health systems uh, and the failure to have proper surveillance and infection control uh, in health systems around the world. So what really this represents is uh, not only a failure to respond to antimicrobial resistance, but to respond to much greater failures which we face every day in our operations. Uh, why have bugs become so resistant to antimicrobial, antifungal and, and antibiotic drugs? Well, the first thing that we would want to say is, uh, of course, resistance has always been there and resistance will continue uh, to be a challenge which uh, we face and which governments and treatment providers face around the world. One of the, the main issues, and I, I know that this was just being discussed, is uh, the, unfortunately our, our research and development, and especially the pharmaceutical sector, has not kept pace with evolving resistance. So what we have seen over the last two decades is a demobilization of the pharmaceutical industry out of research and development in, in these areas of need uh, so that we're not getting the new drugs and the new classes of compounds that we need to address uh, new forms of resistance that emerge. We also simply have the problem that we don't have diagnostics or methods or ways of being able to distinguish uh, the causes of fever and the types of resistance which patients are facing. We also simply have a problem today broadly about access to a lot of existing uh, vaccines and drugs. More people are dying today for a lack of access than uh, due to resistance. And in fact, when you look at some of the vaccines which could both save children's lives and also reduce the use of antibiotics, those are not being used broadly today in part because they often cost too much. So again, what we have here is a, a series of interrelated problems that have to be addressed. Um, and, and certainly this is not only about the blame going around, but it's also about the solutions that have to be taken forward to respond proactively instead of waiting for this to become worse. Christoph Weird, I, I, I saw you nodding there, Professor, in, in, in Kuala Lumpur. Um, do you want to come back on anything that you've heard in the last couple of minutes? And, and then I want to get on to talk about the work that you're doing. All right. Um, I would like to add to what has been said, that besides antibiotic resistance, because of the cutting of a forest throughout the world, we may create new zoonoses, or in other words, the creation of new diseases, um, HIV, Ebola, and Zika virus were not here 70 years ago. And, um, you know, some published evidence clearly demonstrate in recent journals that uh, deforestation creates an opportunity to the emergence of new pathologies. So we have, of course, uh, the problem of antibiotic resistance, but I would like to stress on the fact that we might have in the future new viral diseases. And with transportations, we may have, sadly, I hope not, but the death of millions of people because we are not ready. Hmm? Yeah. All right. Uh, briefly, Professor, tell us about the, the work that you're doing in, in the rainforests uh, of, of tropical we, Asia. We, how, we how, do the, praying, how, how do the compounds we, that you're discovering uh, or rediscovering become the antimicrobial drugs of the future? You see, you see, I, I am sorry to what I'm going to say is going to hurt, but the pharmaceutical industry has huge lobbies, and these lobbies are infiltrating in universities, and this has resulted in the removal of a very important topic in pharmacy and medicine, 
including pharmacognosy or the knowledge of traditional medicines in pharmacy graduates. Believe me or not, but some graduate students from pharmacy don't know what is opium in 2016. We need to separate the influence of the pharmaceutical industry and academia. We need intellectual freedom. We are trying, me, myself, my colleagues, a lot of things throughout the world. A lot of researchers are producing a lot of papers. We have found a lot of molecules, but the industry is not interested. You know, we are running we are fully aware that the rainforest of Southeast Asia is doomed. All of these plants containing wonderful molecules, wonderful drugs, are going to disappear. So we are rushing against time to collect those plants okay. and assess their activities. <clears throat> we have All found right. antiviral molecules, but it, it doesn't interest the industry, you see. So you need to change. You need to have some governments, I mean, doing the job. All you right. cannot depend on industry. Uh, Jim, what, what, do you, what do you make of, of what you just you just heard there? So, I, I you know I've got mixed opinions uh, to be honest. I mean, you know the the pharmaceutical industry needs to behave differently about these things, and in that sense, I have some sympathy with the tone of what the professor's saying, uh, and especially because it's coming at a, at an era. Where, where the world economy is, is, has got so many uh, topical challenges, especially this role of, of big multinationals and their interplay with society. And, and, and a phrase I, I, I love to use, which I learned myself from being in 30 years of finance and the financial crisis, is, is that enlightened self-interest. And the, the very fact that a review like mine uh, was asked to come into existence, the very fact that we've been supported all over the world in making so much noise, the, the very fact that you now have a really important high-level agreement at the UN, I think it's the only fourth time in their history that health has actually had a high-level agreement, all of these things should send very powerful messages to a lot of actors, including the pharmaceutical companies. And it's in their enlightened self-interest to soon start behaving uh, differently than they have before, including the model for drug production. And as I said earlier, I think there are some signs of that happening. And frankly, uh, if they don't, policymakers are going to do tougher things than the pharmaceutical companies would like and want. Mm -hmm. And uh, that has been at the core of why okay. there was quite a bit of controversy about a specific proposal we made, so-called so pay or play, uh, that effectively is forcing the pharma companies to think differently than they've done before. Right, Malpani, in, in Paris, what, what do you make of, of, of that? Well, just to come back on, on uh, um, uh, Lord O'Neill's comment, uh, this is no longer about enlightened self-interest of pharmaceutical companies. This is about governments having to take responsibility for allowing our system of research and development to spin out of control. Over the same 20 years in which the pharmaceutical industry has deinvested from this area, they have also pushed simply one model of drug development to rely upon monopolies and high prices for developing new drugs and for vaccines and diagnostics. And we know that that has failed. Uh, at the same time at which we're having the, the UN special session on antimicrobial resistance, the UN Secretary General has released a new report on access to medicines, which calls essentially for new ways of developing drugs and ensuring they're affordable and accessible including for antibiotics and beyond. We have a crisis today of access to medicines, and we need to find new ways of, of developing drugs. And that means we have to do that not through the patent system, but through new incentives, and especially those that separate the cost of research and development from the final product price to ensure they're affordable and to ensure they're targeted to what we need. Gentlemen, there, I'm afraid we have to end our discussion. We're out of time. Many thanks uh, indeed uh, in New York. Jim O'Neill, the chairman of the UK Commission Review on Antimicrobial Resistance uh, in Paris. Roy Malpani from Doctors Without Borders and uh, in Kuala Lumpur. Christoph Wiat uh, from the University of Nottingham. And thank you for watching. Don't forget you. you can see the program again at any time by visiting the website at aljazeera.com. For further discussion, join us uh, on our Facebook page at facebook.com forward slash AJ Inside Story. Or join us on Twitter, our handle at AJ Inside Story. From me, Adrian Finnegan, and the whole team here in Doha, thanks for watching. We'll see you again. Bye for now.